For those who don't know him, he's a very young and dynamic preacher from Hyderabad, India. He heads the HSI over there, where the Roger and his wife are doing a ministry work in Hyderabad. So let's welcome Brother Roger. Welcome, Brother. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Brother Chris. Thank you for the welcome. Uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me once again for this talk. Am I audible enough to everybody? Yes, brother. Yes. 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 Yeah. Oh, perfect. I'm happy to see Brother Vijay also. I'm sure his back is absolutely fine now. Ah, thank you very much. Yes, it is back to normal. <laughs> back is back to normal. Okay. <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So uh, I'm very happy that on uh, this uh, blessed day of the Feast of the Holy Name of our Blessed Mother Mary, I have been invited to give a talk on her and one very important aspect about her life and her presence in our life. So thank you very much once again for inviting me. And before we begin, let us just offer all our petitions, our intentions, and especially this time of sharing the Word of God. Um, to our beloved Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through the most powerful intercession of the Immaculate Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now in the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. And thank you, Blessed Mother, for choosing this day to speak about you, to learn about you, and to rejoice in your motherhood and your queenship in our lives. My dear sisters and brothers, there is actually a lot to speak about our Blessed Mother. The tragedy is that we think because there is very less mentioned directly about our Blessed Mother in Holy Scriptures. And there is hardly anything that she has spoken, which is recorded in sacred scripture. Most of us, or if not all of us, um, believe and think that uh, there is nothing much to speak about her. We need to probably trace information from here and there. But scripture is filled with references to this extraordinary, exquisite, unique, and exclusive creature created by God, whose name is Mary, which means fullness of grace. And this special creation of God has been specially given the vocation to be someone very special in our lives. So everything about Mary is special. She is special, the person. Uh, she was created by someone who is extraordinarily and uniquely special. The purpose in her life is special. And her vocation for us is also very special. So we are, in fact, so loved by God because he gave his only begotten son. But the more we get to know about Mary, we will slowly come to realize various other aspects of the love of God for us because Mary herself is an expression of God's love for you and for me and of all those who believe in her son, Jesus Christ. She is an extraordinary gift. So let's head straight into the topic. I, I've given the name uh, as uh, Gebira, the eternal Gebira. We will come to that a bit later. Uh, but first we will uh, form a premise, you know. Let us, uh, let us try to make this interesting by forming a premise to the whole um, beauty of our Blessed Mother, learning of our Blessed Mother. My dear sisters and brothers, who is Mary? I would like to spend just about 60 seconds, maybe, a, maybe one minute, just a minute to interact with you because this question is a very simple question. And as Catholics, I hope and presume that those of you who are right now watching me, listening to me on Zoom call, most all of you are Catholics. So I'd like to uh, ask you, who is Mary? Except Brother Vijay, I want uh, others to answer. I don't want Vijay to answer. And I would appreciate if uh, all of you could come on video because I would, I would like to see your faces. Otherwise, yeah. it feels like I'm preaching to the laptop. 
correct, correct. Very true, very true. Thank you. Yeah, so who is our Blessed Mother? Who is Mary? Mother of Jesus. Mother of Jesus, wonderful. What else? She's the intercessor. For Mother of God. I beg your pardon? Mother of God. Mother of God, yes, an intercessor, yes. Intercessor what else? Somebody else? Mother of all of us. Mother of all of us. Amen. Yeah. Surely, yes. The instrument through whom we have received our salvation. Oh, ah, yes. beautiful. The instrument through whom we have received our salvation. Fantastic. Very theological. Good. New all these. The, covenant. the new Ark of the Covenant. Wonderful. Yes. And that brings us to the end of my talk. <laughs> 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 Wonderful answers. All of them are absolutely right. But we will dwell a little more deeper into what you have shared about who Mary is so that we understand scripturally, through scriptures, the extravagance of the holiness and purpose and existence of our Blessed Mother. Our Blessed Mother is eternal because she is with God and God is eternal. Our Blessed Mother is immaculate. She was completely pure, totally pure, preserved by God miraculously even before birth. And not only that, she was preserved even after her birth and she was taken in the state of being immaculate to heaven. That is, that is a favor, that is a gift given to no other creature God has ever created. And God personally has done all of this. So God's love for Mary is far greater than the love that you and I can ever show to our Blessed Mother. Jesus loves Mary more than you and I can ever even imagine. So no amount of your rosaries, no amount of your novenas, no uh, amount of the number of times you visit Marian shrines, None of these will ever compare to the love that Jesus has. So if anybody tells you, why do you love Mary? The simple, no nonsense answer is because Jesus loves her. As simple as that. Because Jesus loves his mother and Jesus honors his mother by listening to what she says and granting her whatever she asks, you and I are also called to put that trust in her. But of course, there are people who want to know more you know, people are not very satisfied with simple answers. So it is my pleasure to complicate your life with some more information. Okay. Now, my dear sisters and brothers, in the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, chapter 3, verse 15, we read, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first book of the Bible, which is in the New Testament. No, <laughs> the Old Testament. The first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. This is God speaking to Satan, a creature that he created beautiful, but the creature rebelled against God and became evil. And this is Lucifer that we are talking about. And God is telling him that he will put enmity between him and the woman. So even before the story of salvation could come into existence, God has plans for the woman. And that woman is Mary. We will come to know that very quickly. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head. The offspring of Mary will bruise the head of Satan and he shall, and you shall bruise his heel. The passion of our Lord for the work done by Satan in mankind, and that is sin. Now, this is from the first Bible, the, the first book of the Bible. The very first book of the Bible begins by talking about the woman, the Blessed Mother. Now, if there is a first, there has to be a last. Yes or no? So what does the last book of the Bible say? Revelations chapter 12, verse 1. The book of Revelations chapter 12, verse 1 says, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 
12 stars. This is the description given by the Holy Bible about the woman. And the description is that a great sign appeared in heaven. So the woman is now pictured in heaven, clothed with the sun. The woman is pictured clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. Now, these words are not mere descriptions, my dear sisters and brothers. These words are very important for us children of God to understand Mary. You see, the woman clothed with the sun simply means that Mary draws her light from the eternal son of God, who is the light of heaven and earth. Mary does not have light by her own self. Mary does not illumine herself or illuminate herself by her own power or by her own brightness. She is lit up brightly by the light of the sun. She illuminates the glory and the brightness of the son of God, who is Jesus. So she's clothed with the son of God, with the moon under her feet. You see, the moon also is that creation of God, which does not emit light by itself. It reflects the light of the sun. So Mary is also that creature who reflects the light of the sun. And on her head, a crown of 12 stars. 12 is a very significant number in the Old Testament. At the same time, it is also a very significant number in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there were 12 tribes in the kingdom of Israel. In the New Testament, there are 12 disciples, 12 apostles of Jesus. So 12, the significant number, is mentioned here in the last book of Revelation, in the chapter 12, verse 1, where the, the Bible is talking about the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and her head has a crown of 12 stars, which means she is the queen of the new tribes of God. She is the queen of the new Israel. So the 12 number signifying the tribes of Israel is the number of stars which adorn her crown. We see from the very beginning that God gives Mary a unique role in salvation history. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. This refers to Jesus, the enmity, and Mary refers to the woman. The phrase, her seed, which means, you know, the, the Greek word is spermatos. The Greek word for seed is spermatos. And from this Greek word comes the English word sperm, seed, which a man places in, the, in, in a woman. And then she conceives by the grace of, by the power of God Almighty. So her seed, the spermatos, is not seen elsewhere. This word is nowhere else used in the Holy Bible. The Greek word spermatos is nowhere else used in the Bible because it is specifically used for the seed of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and that seed is Jesus. The scriptures begin and end with woman battling Satan. The book of Genesis talks about the woman, and then the book of Revelation talks about the woman. This points to the power of the woman with the seed and teaches us that Jesus and Mary are the new Adam and the new Eve. My dear sisters and brothers, the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, verse 42 to 43. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, verse 42 to 43 says, and she exclaimed with a loud cry. We are talking about who Mary is. We're trying to understand who Mary is. First, we understood about the woman mentioned in the, in the book of Genesis and the book of Revelations. Now we are looking at the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, verse 42 to 43, where it says, and she exclaimed with a loud cry. Who exclaimed? Elizabeth, the kinswoman of our blessed mother Mary. Okay. Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. Does this ring a bell? Do you say these words anytime? Have you ever said these words anytime in your life? When we pray the Holy Mary, these are the words that we exclaim. Rephrased, paraphrased by the teachings of the church. But it is, these are basically the words of our, 
uh, of, of Saint Elizabeth, the mother of Saint John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, the, the first cousin of Jesus. Now, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me? She says, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? You see, my dear sisters and brothers, Elizabeth, already filled with the Holy Spirit, is given the revelation, the inspiration that Mary is the mother of her Lord. Mary did not come with a banner on her head or a sash on her shoulder saying, hey, look at me, mother of Jesus. Or there were no pamphlets that were distributed before Mary was approaching uh, uh, the house of Elizabeth and the pamphlet read, arriving soon, Mary, mother of the Messiah. No, there was nothing of that sort. The Holy Spirit's inspiration reveals to Mary, uh, Elizabeth and Elizabeth exclaims, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? My dear sisters and brothers, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. The phrase, blessed are you among women, this phrase, blessed are you among women, really means you are most blessed of all women, which means there is no other woman like you ever. There was no woman like you. There is no woman like you. There will be no woman like you. That is what it means. Blessed are you among all women. Now, note also, uh, notice also that Elizabeth praises Mary first and then Jesus. She doesn't praise Jesus first and then Mary. She says, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord? First comes the mother, then my Lord. She doesn't say, how is it possible that my Lord has brought his mother? Are you paying attention? Are you able to understand what I'm saying? Yes. Am I, yes, uh, yes, am I fast good. or? No, okay. No, no. okay. Because Brother Chris Brooks told that I'm a young preacher, so I, I can go a bit fast. So please stop me if I am. Okay. Yeah. So she goes on to say, blessed are you among women. But then when she says, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Elizabeth first praises Mary and then Jesus. This is the teaching where we get to learn about hyperdulia. You see, my dear sisters and brothers, hyperdulia, the spelling is H-Y-P-E-R-D-U-L-I-A hyperdulia. Dulia and hyperdulia are two things that we need to remember when it comes to our veneration to our Blessed Mother, okay? Now, there is a word which is contrast to hyperdulia or dulia, that is latria. Latria, L-A-T-R-I-A, means sacrificial in nature. And sacrificial worship is dedicated and reserved only for God. We offer ourselves as sacrifice, a living sacrifice to God. And offering ourselves as a living fact, sacrifice is the perfect form of worship. For the Catholic Church, the perfect form of prayer and worship is the Holy Eucharist. And the Holy Eucharist is a worship of sacrifice. It is the form of sacrifice in worship. It is the Lamb of God, which, which is sacrificed on the altar of God. And even in the Old Testament, people made sacrifices to atone for their sins. It was their way of worshiping God. So uh, latria is that, under, is that word that describes worship, which is reserved only to God. Hyperdulia is the word which is reserved only for that creature whom God created, who is like no other creature, completely holy and immaculate, except in level one less to God. There is no other creature who is as Mary there is, that God has created. If there is any other creature, sorry, not creature, if there's any other person who is greater than Mary and is also a human being, then that is Jesus. But he is not just a human being, he's also God at the same time. Jesus is divine and human at the same time. So other than our blessed Lord Jesus, if there's any other creature, if there's any other person who is venerable and who can, uh, who, who, who can be given 
ultimate veneration and respect and honor, that is Mary. So the veneration of Mary, the respect given to Mary, and the affection and honor given to Mary is called hyperdulia. In English, dulia is also called veneration. Hyperdulia is essentially a heightened degree, an ultimately high degree of dulia, high degree of veneration. And this is provided only to the Blessed Virgin Mary. So we don't give Mary latria. We don't offer sacrifices to Mary. We don't worship Mary. We give her hyperdulia which is the highest form of dulia, which means the highest form of veneration, because dulia means veneration. Hyperdulia means highest form of veneration. So now I hope your doubts about do we worship Mary or do we venerate Mary are clarified. Okay. Elizabeth's use, um, Elizabeth's use of mother of my Lord. In Hebrew, the word that describes mother of the word that describes my Lord in the Hebrew Bible is Adonai. Elizabeth uses the mother of her Adonai, which means Lord God. Adonai means Lord God. You see, there is one very, very important and common prayer which the Jews pray in the morning when they get up and just before they go into sleep. It is the Shema. It's called the Shema. It is, it is mentioned in the Old Testament. Shema o Israel Adonai Eloheinu, Eloheinu Adonai Echad, which means, the, listen, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. The Lord is God, Adonai Echad, uh, Eloheinu, that is, the Lord is God, Adonai Echad, the Lord is one. And this is the basis for some thing we Catholics proclaim every Sunday in Mass, and that is, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ. We say all of this, but we say, I believe in one God, and that one God is Lord. So Elizabeth is talking about that one God, Adonai, Lord God. And mother of Adonai is the equivalent of Holy Mary, Mother of God, which Catholics pray in the rosary. The formula is very simple. Jesus is a divine person. I repeat, Jesus is a divine person. And this person is God. Mary is Jesus's mother. So Mary is the mother of God. Thank you, Brother Richard. I hope you like formulas. It helps understand things better. Do you like formulas or are you, yeah, you're, yeah. Not very, you're not a fan of math? Okay, <laughs> nonetheless, this will help you. Okay, so Jesus is a divine person and this person is God. Mary is Jesus's mother. So Mary is the mother of God. Mary is not just mother of Jesus's human nature. Jesus's human nature is because he is God incarnate. God became man. man. So the nature that he took is the human nature. But Mary is not just the mother of his human nature because mothers cannot be mothers of nature. Catherine, Mrs. Uh, Catherine Lazarus, are you, the, are you a mother? Do you have children? Sister Catherine, Catherine Lazarus. Sister Catherine. Yes, yes, she's a mother. Okay, she's on mind. mute, okay. So she, has, she is a mother. mother um, yes. Yeah, yeah, she is. Are, are, you, are you mother of the nature of your children or you are mother of their persons, the body, soul, and their nature? You're the mother of all of them, right? Yes. So in the same way, Jesus' mother is not a mother just of his nature. She is the mother of the person of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise Hallelujah. You. Hallelujah. Thank Hallelujah. you, Jesus. So my dear sisters and brothers, Mary is the mother of God. She is the Theotokos, the Greek word which, ex which explains the mother of God. Theo means God. Tokos means mother. Theotokos means the mother of God. Mary is truly the mother of God. Moving on. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. 
St. Paul's letter to Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. St. Paul categorically explains, proclaims that when the fullness of time had come, that is when the Old Testament comes to a completion and a new covenant God is about to begin, God sent forth his only begotten son, born of a woman. It was a miraculous birth because the spouse of Mary is the Holy Spirit because the scripture very clearly says that she was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. She Amen. conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the spouse of Mary is the Holy Spirit in that, in that manner of speaking, not literally, okay? Uh, uh, the earthly husband, the earthly spouse of Mary is Saint Joseph, okay? Now, Saint Paul says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman under the law. My dear sisters and brothers, God sent his son born of a woman to redeem us. He came into the world to save us. Jesus came into this world to save us. Mary is the woman with the redeemer. You see, this is a very important information that we need to always remember. We can never forget this. Mary is always with the redeemer. Mary is never without Jesus. Even before she was born, she had to do something with Jesus. She was with Jesus in the eternal plan of God. She was preserved by God even before time, which means even before her conception, even before time, Mary was with God. And God means Father, Son, and Spirit. Even after her birth, Mary was with Jesus. And when she conceived, then onwards, she is with the incarnate God. God incarnate, that is Jesus in the flesh. Until then, she was with Jesus in his spirit. Now she's with Jesus also in his flesh. So Mary is always the woman with the Redeemer. By calling Mary co-redemptrix, Mary's, one of Mary's titles are, is co-redemptrix. C-O-R-E-D-E-M-P-T-R-I-X. Co-redemptrix which simply means we are calling Mary the woman with the Redeemer. This is because co is from the Latin word cum, C-U-M, which means with. When you use the word cum in Latin, you mean to use the English word with. So co-redemptrix means with the Redeemer. So Mary the woman is always with the Redeemer. That is why she's called the co-redemptrix. Mary had a unique but subordinate role to Jesus in salvation. The highest role that anyone played in the story of salvation is Jesus. And if there's anyone who is next in line, who has a much important role is Mary. And that is because she's always with the Redeemer. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 22, verse 35. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 2, verse 25 says, And a sword will pierce through your own soul. This is a prophecy by the prophet Simeon, the old man who was sitting at the temple, waiting to see his Messiah, his Savior. And God gives him that blessing by enabling him to witness his God in the flesh. St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 35. When Simeon looks, uh, finds Mary with the child, the Holy Spirit moves him to go to the child, and the Holy Spirit reveals to him that he is the Messiah that this man has been waiting for all the days of his life. So you see, my dear sisters and brothers, the first person to discover Jesus in the flesh other than Mary and Joseph, other than the shepherds, because the shepherds were brought to the, to the cave. The first person who recognized the Savior by being attentive to the Holy Spirit is an elderly person. 
this teaches us that we should respect the experience and spiritual knowledge of our elders because our elders teach us to discover Jesus in this world. Simeon discovers Jesus, his Messiah, and when he sees his mother, he proclaims these words, and a sword will pierce through your own soul, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. So that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Simeon prophesizes that a sword would also pierce Mary's soul. Mary thus plays a very important role in our redemption. While Jesus' suffering was all that we needed for redemption, all that we needed was the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus for our salvation. But God desired Mary to participate on a subordinate level, you know, a lesser level, in her son's suffering, just as he allows us to participate through our own sufferings. You see, my dear sisters and brothers, God does not want us to suffer. If he wanted us to suffer, Jesus would, not, Jesus would never come into this world. The sin, sin came into the world and God would have simply looked, yeah, it is your fault. You guys sinned, so go suffer. No, God does not want us to suffer. And the proof of that is that he sent his only begotten son as a sacrificial lamb for the atonement of our sins. But at the same time, God allows us to suffer. And suffering is good at times. It is good because it teaches us our dependency on God. It teaches us the value of what we have achieved and attained through the Paschal mystery our Lord has gifted us. So my dear sisters and brothers, when Simeon spoke these words in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 2, verse 19, as well as 51, we learn something what Mary did when she used to listen to these kind of things from people. When she used to listen to these kind of prophecies, the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 19, verse 51, describes what Mary's response used to be. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. So the response of Mary to these kind of prophecies was contemplation. She used to meditate. She would never react or respond to these things. She would hide them all in her heart and she would meditate on these things. The Gospel of St. Luke chapter 2 verse 51 also says the same thing. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. This is the he here is Jesus. After finding him in the temple, they take him back home. And when he went back home with Mary and Joseph to Nazareth, he was submissive to them. And what did Mary do by witnessing all these things? The scripture says, and his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. So the heart of Mary is holy because this heart is constantly contemplating God and his word. The Immaculate Heart of Mary is constantly meditating and contemplating the mysteries of God, the revealed nature of God and the Word of God. This is why we have recourse to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, my dear sisters and brothers. Mary kept in mind all these things as she pondered them in her heart. Catholics remember this by devoting themselves to Mary's Immaculate Heart and all the treasures and wisdom and knowledge that is contained in that heart. Mm. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Ave Maria. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we have so far learned who Mary is. Now let us move on to another important aspect of the life of our Blessed Mother, and that is she is the new Ark of the Covenant. Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant. My dear sisters and brothers, if we go back to the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, chapter 25, verses 11, this book from the Holy Scriptures teaches us that, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Chapter 25, God, in, in the book of Exodus, God is giving instructions of how the Ark of the Covenant has to be made. And one of the things that he says in chapter 25, verse 11 is, thou shall overlay this ark with pure gold. He doesn't say gold. He says pure gold. 
within and without, which means inside and out, the Ark of the Covenant has to be laid with pure gold. And they overlay it and shall make upon it a crown of gold round about it. So you see, my dear sisters and brothers, the very make of the Ark of the Covenant is of pure gold. But the Ark of the Covenant was the vessel in which the word of God was kept, the Ten Commandments, including with the staff of Moses and the bread of the presence, manna, the bread of the presence. Okay, So these were the things, the holy things, which were kept in the Ark of the Covenant. But these were just symbols. These were not the real presence of God. God was not really in the flesh present in the Ark. These were the signs and symbols that were speaking about the presence of God. And even though they were just symbolic in nature about the presence of God, God ensured that the vessel that contains the symbolic presence is made out of pure metal, pure gold, which is the highest metal that they could find, the greatest metal that they could find. Now, if God can be so particular about just an earthly vessel in which the signs and symbols of his presence have to be kept. Imagine how careful and how meticulous God will be to create the vessel in which he himself will come and dwell. If the Old Testament ark was made of pure gold, the New Testament ark also has to be pure, which is why Mary, who is the ark in which the word of God became flesh, had to be immaculate, pure, stainless, without even the stain of original sin. And the purity of the old Ark of the Testament was so, um, so unimaginable, unimaginably great. We can learn that from the second book of Samuel chapter 6 verse 7. The second book of Samuel chapter 6 verse 7 says, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of God. This guy, Uzzah, died. The Lord smote him. What did he do that he had to die and get this punishment from God? Punishment of death. Because accidentally, Uzzah touched the ark of the covenant. Only the priests were allowed to touch or carry the ark of the covenant. That too, with the, uh, the rods that were used to carry. They were not even allowed to touch the ark as such. Only the, the rods which used to carry. So the man who was not meant to touch the ark touched it and he instantly died beside the ark. That was how holy the ark of the covenant is of the Old Testament. Yes. And the new ark of the covenant, which is Mary, is far more precious and holier than that. The Ark of the Old Covenant was made of the purest gold for God's word. Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant and is the purest vessel for the word of God made flesh. The Ark is so holy and pure that when Uzzah touched it, the Lord slew him. This shows us that the Ark is undefiled. Nothing sinful can touch the Ark of the Covenant. In the same way, not even the stain of original sin could touch the new Ark of the Covenant, who is Mary. She was spared even from the stain of original sin by the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. My dear sisters and brothers, the Gospel of St. Luke is a beautiful testament of our Blessed Mother. The first chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter, verse 39, Luke 1, 39 says, in those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. Earlier, we learned about Elizabeth proclaiming, how can the mother of my Lord come to me? In the same context, in the same scripture, in Luke chapter 1, verse 39, we read, in those days, Mary arose, okay? Mary arose and went with haste. It is not uh, Elizabeth coming to Mary, but it is Mary coming, going to Elizabeth in the hill country in a town in Judah. Now, when Mary went to visit Elizabeth, Mary was already pregnant. Our Blessed Mother was already pregnant. And Elizabeth is in Judah. King David first became the king of the kingdom of Judah. He was not the king of the entire nation of Israel. When, when David became the king of Judah, Saul was the king of the rest of the tribes of Israel. 
Elizabeth was in that hill country, a hill country in which the ancient times David was the king. So Mary, who is now pregnant with the king of kings, went in haste to the hill country, Judah. Now, it is here that you need to understand that it is not just the mother of Jesus who is going to Judah. It is the new Ark of the Covenant which is going to Judah. Now, why is this important? Why is it important for us to understand that the new Ark of the Covenant is going to Judah, to Elizabeth's house? Because in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 2, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 2, we learn this. The word of God says, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Bali, Judah, to bring up from there the Ark of the Covenant, which is called by the name of the Lord of Hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. The Lord of Hosts' presence went with the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant was in Judah, and David oh, went. David went to bring the Ark of the Covenant. So you see the connect between the old Ark of the Covenant and the new Ark of the Covenant and the commonality is the kingdom of Judah. Luke's conspicuous comparison between Mary and the Ark described by Samuel underscores the reality of Mary as the undefiled and immaculate heart of the new covenant. In these verses, Mary is the Ark who arose and went David also arose and went to the ark. There is a clear parallel between the ark of the old and the ark of the New Testament. So, any doubts about the ark of the covenant, of the new covenant? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Now, this understanding of who Mary is, the co-redemptrists, the Theotokos, the mother of God, and then she is also the one whom God is speaking in the first book and the last book of the Bible. The woman whose seed is the enmity between this, uh, against the seed of Satan. We have understood who Mary is. We've also understood that Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant. And we've seen the comparisons of scripture from the new with the scriptures of the Old Testament, which describes about the Ark of the Covenant. Now we come to the final part of understanding Mary as the Gebira, G-E-B-I-R-A-H. Mary the Gebira, in other words, that is the Hebrew for queen mother. Gebira means the queen mother. And Mary is our eternal Gebira, our eternal queen mother mother. My dear sisters and brothers, let us once again go to the last book of the Bible, chapter 12, verse 2. Book of Revelations, chapter 12, verse 2. It reads, she was pregnant, okay? The woman was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains. Mary, the woman who was pregnant, was crying out in birth pains, in labor pain, basically, and the agony of giving birth. She was crying out in labor pain and she was in the agony of giving birth. Now, this verse is very famous among Protestant brothers and sisters because the Protestant brothers and sisters claim this scripture to mention that Mary is that woman who is sinful because only women, because of the original sin, have to go through labor pain. If a person who is not with sin will not go through labor pain. So Protestants say, how can Mary be so holy and so immaculate when she, the scripture itself says that she is going through labor pain? Are you with me, my dear sisters and brothers? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. So, so this, is the, this is the Protestant accusation. How can Mary be immaculate when scripture is clear, clearly mentioning that she is a woman who is going through labor pain and women are going through labor pain only because of the first, woman, first woman's sin. And God said, when you give birth, you shall give birth in pain. 
my dear sisters and brothers, Revelation, the book of Revelation, is an apocalyptic literature. It means the book of Revelation is, the style of the writing of the book of Revelation is futuristic. It talks about what is about to happen, what will happen. It does not talk about what has already happened or what is happening. It talks about what is about to happen. No other book in the Bible speaks about what is about to happen. No other book in the New Testament. I, let me underline that. Revelation is an apocalyptic literature unique to the first century. It contains many and different symbolism and multiple meanings of one word. One word can mean many things in the book of Revelation. So the word woman in the book of Revelation here, Mary, can, uh, the word woman in the book of Revelation can mean Mary, it can mean church, and it can also mean Israel. These are the three different connotations of the word woman in the book of Revelation. So when, when the word of God says she was pregnant, the woman was pregnant and was carrying out in, crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth, to understand this scripture, we need to once again go back to the Old Testament in the book of prophet Isaiah. The book of prophet Isaiah chapter 66 verse 7 says, before she was in labor, she gave birth. I repeat, before she was in labor, she gave birth. Now, there are several mothers on this Zoom call. Has any mother given birth to a child before going to labor pain? It's impossible. It cannot happen. But the word of God is talking about a woman in the book of prophet Isaiah, chapter, six, chapter 66, verse 7. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she delivered her son. She did not even just go into labor. She also delivered without going, going through labor pain. This is a Marian prophecy. This prophecy of prophet Isaiah is about our blessed mother. She gave birth to Jesus without going through any labor pain. Let us understand the birth of Jesus is not an ordinary birth of a child. Jesus came into this world to take away upon, to take on him our pain and suffering, our sickness and our failures, our brokenness and our infirmities and our uh, vulnerabilities. How can a person who claims to heal us can give pain when he comes to us? It is impossible. That is the reason why when Jesus comes into the world, he ensures that his mother does not go through any pain because he comes into this world as a savior and the savior of the world does not give pain, but takes upon himself our pain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank, Thank you, Jesus. Praise, Praise you, Jesus. Praise so my dear sisters and brothers, Isaiah prophesies about our blessed mother, the virgin mother giving birth to a son whose name is Jesus the Christ. Now, St. Paul also talks about something about labor pain, but the beauty is St. Paul makes it look very funny. But this funny aspect of what St. Paul is talking about is actually the way we should interpret labor pain in the book of Revelation. St. Paul's letter to Galatians chapter four, verse 19 says, St. Paul's letter to Galatians chapter four, verse 19 says, my little children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. So St. Paul is clearly telling us that he is going through labor pain. A man, St. Paul is a man, by the way. You are clear about that, no? That St. Paul is a man? Yeah. So Paul is... Paul's writings are in the Bible. 70% of the New Testament is written by St. Paul. This great apostle of the Gentiles, handpicked by Jesus, is telling that he's going through labor pain. Now, any practical person will say this is a lie because no man can go through labor pain. Yes or no? Every woman will testify that no man can go through labor pain. Every man will testify to that. But St. Paul, the man, is speaking specifically 
my little children for whom I am again in anguish of childbirth, in other words, labor pain, until Christ is formed in you. Now keep this in your mind and go back to the Old Testament, to the book of prophet Jeremiah, chapter 13, verse 21. The book, of chap the book of prophet Jeremiah, chapter 13, verse 21. It says, what will you say when they set as head over you, those whom you yourself have taught to be friends to you? Will not pangs take hold of you? Will not pangs, which means pain, will not pangs take hold of you like those of a woman in labor? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 You Hallelujah. see, my dear sisters and brothers, Jeremiah is talking to Israel. He's pro prophesying to the people of Israel. And he is telling Israel that you will be like a woman who is in labor pain. So the, the word labor, pain of labor, can be used in different meanings. It does not mean it is the literal translation that Mary went through labor pain to give birth to the King of Kings, Jesus. It is a symbolic way of speaking in the book of Revelations. So this is an explanation that Mary gave birth to Jesus without going through labor pain because she is immaculate. She has not sinned. Therefore, she does not have to carry any wages of sin, including death. Praise the Lord. Praise Hallelujah. the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, the book of Revelations, chapter 12, verse 13 to 17, it says, and birth. he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. Now here, the word of God is talking about the woman and the serpent. The last book of the Bible is talking about the woman and the serpent. The first book of the Bible also spoke about the woman and the serpent. So there is clear parallel between the first Eve and the new Eve, the old Eve and the new Eve, which is Mary. And the serpent poured out water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth held the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now this last sentence, this last verse, of the book of Revelations, chapter 12, verse 17. Please pay attention. When the dragon was, when the dragon tried his best to defeat the woman, when the dragon tried his best to destroy the woman, and the result was that she could not be destroyed, what did he do? He left her and went behind her other children. So the dragon was enraged with the woman. He was so upset and angry with the woman that he's not able to defeat her. So he went off to make war with the rest of her children. And by the way, the word of God doesn't end there. The word of God describes who are the children of Mary. And the word of God says, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. These are the other children of Mary who are being attacked by the dragon who is demon who is Satan. So my dear sisters and brothers, in these verses, we see that the devil still seeks to destroy the woman. He's still trying to destroy Mary, but because he cannot directly destroy Mary, he's trying to hurt her by hurting us and by destroying us, her children, believers. Even after Jesus is born, he's still trying to hurt us. This proves that Mary is a danger to Satan. Mary is a constant enemy to Satan, even after the birth of Christ. This is because God has given Mary the power to intercede for us, and we should invoke her assistance in our spiritual lives. Now, this brings us to the final part of understanding Gebira, the Queen Mother. My dear sisters and brothers, 
if we look into the Gospel of St. John, chapter 2, we read about the first miracle of our blessed Lord Jesus. And what was the first miracle of our Lord? Come on. Why? I know. Wedding at Cana. Wedding at Cana. No. Wedding at Cana is the location of the first miracle of Jesus. My question was, what was water the first turned into, into wine? Water turned into wine. Ah, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus turned Jesus. water into wine. Is he doing that even now? Is he doing that even now? Water here, water signifies nothingness and wine signifies God's blessings. And it happened in marriage. So when we give ourselves to Jesus, Jesus transforms everything about us into what is holy and rich. Wine is a symbolism of richness. And when Jesus is transforming something ordinary into extraordinary, it always remains extraordinary. Praise the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 So Hallelujah. the Gospel of St. John chapter 2 verse 3 says, When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, the mother of Jesus said to Jesus, they have no wine. How simple, no? See, when we have a request to make, most of the time, we go with a long story. You see, actually, the bus was not there. I went late at the bus stop. And just before I could come, the bus went away. And then when I had to wait for the auto, the auto didn't come. The taxi didn't come. That's why I became late. And before I could reach the office, the lift was overcrowded. I couldn't get inside the lift. And when I got inside the lift, the power went off. So I was stuck in so many things. So can you please excuse me today? Mary doesn't give all this jargon, all these stories and all that. She goes straight to the point. She goes to Jesus because she knows only Jesus has a solution. And she tells straight the problem. And the problem is, she says, there they have no wine. And then the Gospel of St. John, chapter 2, verse 7, we read, Jesus said to the servants. First, Gospel of St. John, chapter 2, verse 3, we have Mary identifying the problem. Then Mary knowing and putting the trust in God, that is Jesus, that he can solve the problem. Then Mary interceding to Jesus on behalf of the wedding party. So Mary is the intercessor here. And she intercedes with confidence, by the way. If she had no confidence in Jesus, she would not have gone to Jesus and says, there is no wine. She would have gone to the uh, steward and say, hey, go, go to the shop and bring more wine. She went straight to Jesus and said, they have no wine. And then later on in verse 7 of the Gospel of St. John chapter 2, we learn, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And the servants filled them to the brim. And we all know what happened. The water, when others tasted, it tasted as the best wine. So you see, my dear sisters and brothers, when Mary intercedes for us to Jesus, Jesus cannot say no to her request. This is the missing code to understand Mary, the Queen Mother. This is the New Testament hint to understand Mary, the Queen Mother. You see, in the first book of Kings, chapter 2, verse 17 and 20, the first book of Kings, chapter 2, verse 17 and 20, we learn the following. And, G and he said, Please ask King Solomon. Adonijah tells the Queen Mother, Bathsheba, and what does he say? He says, Please ask King Solomon, he will not refuse you to give me Abishag the Shunammite as my wife. You see, a request is being made to the queen mother, Bathsheba, because she's the mother of the king Solomon. And the request is made with so much of confidence. And that confidence is that Adonijah says, if you go to Solomon and request, he will not say no to you because the kings are not meant to say no to the queen mother. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Then Bathsheba says to King Solomon in verse 20, I have one small request to make of you. Okay. The mother of Solomon, King Solomon, Queen Bathsheba says, I have a small request to make of you. Please do not refuse me. This is what Bathsheba tells to Solomon. Now listen carefully to the response of Solomon. Solomon says, King Solomon says to Queen Bathsheba, make 
take your request, my mother, for I will not refuse you. Amen. Make your request, my mother, for I will not refuse you. You see, my dear sisters and brothers, this scripture, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 17 and 20, teaches us that when the mother of the king makes requests to the king, the king does not refuse the mother. Okay. Amen. Amen. Then verse 18, when Adonijah requests Bathsheba to go and make intercession to the king, you know what Mary, you know what the queen mother tells to Adonijah? She says, okay, very well. I will speak for you to the king, which means I will make intercession for you to the king. I will go and talk to the king on your behalf. This you have to keep in mind when you understand intercessions of our blessed mother. In the Old Testament, Davidic kingdom, in the Old Testament Davidic kingdom, the queen intercedes on behalf of the king's followers. Okay? In the Old Testament Davidic kingdom, the queen intercedes on behalf of the king's followers. But the important thing is, the queen here is not the wife of the king. It is the mother of the king. In the Davidic kingdom, it is never the wife of the king who becomes the queen. It is always the mother of the king who becomes the queen. So it is she who makes requests and petitions and intercessions to the king in this Davidic uh, kingdom. This is why the queen mother, the Gebira, is important. Because she makes petitions to the king and the king never refuses any petition by the queen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 19 goes on to say, So Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him on behalf of Adonijah. And the king, what happens when she goes? As soon as the queen mother, as soon as Bathsheba enters into the courts of King Solomon, King Solomon, the king of all of Israel, the chosen and anointed man of God, gets up. The king rose up to meet his mother and he bowed down to his mother. Then he sat on his throne and he had a seat brought for the king's mother and she, pay attention, the queen mother, she sat on his right hand. Amen. The queen mother sat on his right hand. So the queen mother of the Davidic kingdom always sits on the right hand of the king of the Davidic kingdom. Jesus comes from the line of King David. He is from the line of the Davidic kings. It's only that this king is the king of kings. His kingdom has no end. And because Mary is the mother of this king, she, the queen mother, is always at the right hand of the king, making petitions and intercessions and requests for those who follow the king. And that is you and me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Hallelujah. Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The Lord. Hallelujah. So my dear sisters and brothers, Jesus, saying, as, as Solomon rose and gave honor to his mother Bathsheba, by making her sit next to him on the right-hand side, Jesus also honors Mary by loving her, by granting her requests and making her sit right next to him at the right-hand side. And the intentions, the intercessions, the requests and the prayers that Mary gives, brings to Jesus, he never says no. Finally, the, book of, the second book of Chronicles, chapter 22, verse 10. It teaches us again the same thing. There was a person, a, a, um, uh, a queen mother, Athalia. When, when Athalia, the mother of Ahaziah, Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and she destroyed all the royal family of the house of Judah. Here, Queen Athalia is the queen mother Athalia, the queen mother of Ahaziah. The queen mother plays a very significant role in the kingdom. She has authority to destroy. She has authority to, pay, to make commands, to give commands. And you know what is the command that the queen mother Mary gave to the servants at the wedding feast of Cana? The queen mother said, do what he tells you. 
She says, do what he tells you. That's when the servants went to Jesus and did what Jesus told them. And Jesus said, fill the jars with water. And they did it. They filled the jars with water. So you see, our queen mother has authority to command. She has a very important role to play in the kingdom of Jesus. Another book in the Old Testament from the, book, from the prophet Nehemiah, the book of prophet Nehemiah, chapter two, verse six says, and the king said to me, and the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, even here in the book of prophet Nehemiah, we come to know that the queen mother is sitting next to the king at the right hand side. She is the primary intercessor before the king. She is the personal closest intercessor to the king. If you go to the king through the mother, you are sure to receive what you ask. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. you, Jesus. Thank but you. what you ask should be good for your soul. You, can, you cannot ask some random things which are, you know, uh, for somebody else's destruction or for your own destruction. You cannot go to Mary and say, I'm fed up with this life. I want to commit suicide. Please answer my prayer. She's not going to answer those kind of prayers. Okay. So my dear sisters and brothers, I hope you have understood who the Gebira is, who the eternal Gebira, the eternal queen mother is. And with this, I'd like to end by quoting one very important scripture from Psalm 45 verse nine. Psalm 45 verse nine says, daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Even the psalmist is prophesying about the queen mother. He's telling that Jesus has daughters of kings as his ladies of honor. And at his right hand stands the queen in gold. And the queen in gold is the queen mother. And the queen mother is Mary, who is your mother and my mother, given to us by Jesus from the cross. When he looked at his beloved disciple, from the cross, he said to him, behold, your mother. And John the apostle is the symbol of all those people who love Jesus and keep his commandments. So Mary is the mother of all believers given to us by Jesus, the queen mother. The psalmist teaches us that the queen stands at the right hand of God. And the role of the queen is important in the, in the kingdom of God. Mary, the queen of heaven, is at the right hand of the king of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ. And this is why we should never forget and we should never stop praying to Mary, honoring Mary, venerating Mary, and loving Mary as our mother and as our queen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as Amen. it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen.